Okay, so probably uh, we can start. The, as I can see that the, all the, 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 the people in the area are here. I mean, in the whole campus <laughs> are already here. So let's start. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think welcome to this uh, IAS uh, Distinguished Lecture. And uh, it's my honor to introduce you uh, today's uh, seminar speaker, uh, Professor, I think I'm not sure how to, Julius uh, Rubeck, is that correct? Good. I see. So Professor Julius Rubeck uh, is a member of the uh, United States Ac National Academy of Science and European Academy of Science. And uh, he is a world uh, renowned pioneer uh, in the supermolecular chemistry. He has uh, made a significant contribution in the area of self assembly, self -rep uh, replicating system molecular encapsulation, biomimic chemistry, innate uh, immunity, nerve agent, anti-dots, uh, uh, and sensors. I think it's a, a many, many areas. So he has made a significant contribution. And before I pass the stage to him, I briefly, briefly give you some idea of, about his uh, history. He received his PhD from MIT in 1970. And immediately after that, uh, he uh, assumed assistant professor in the uh, University of uh, California, Los Angeles. And he stayed there until 1976. And in 1976, he moved to University of Pittsburgh as a chair professor there. And in 1989, he came back to MIT as a chair professor in, in the chemistry department. And he stayed there for seven years. And in 1996, he moved to uh, move his research group to the Squibb Institute uh, to become the director of the Skak Institute for Chemical Biology. And since then, he has uh, is there. And uh, actually, in November 2013, he also uh, been uh, appointed uh, as a, a distinguished professor under the uh, Senior Source and Talents Program in mainland China, actually is a, a professor in chemistry department, Fudan University. So I have some joint uh, appointment there. And I think uh, he received uh, numerous uh, ACS uh, international award and give uh, many uh, distinguished lectures in the worldwide. I don't think I need to uh, mention as uh, in view of his capacity as a uh, member of the United States National Academy of Science, you will know that I don't need to mention the other. Okay, so I think uh, to make my introduction short, I pass the stage to Professor Babax for his talk. And today he's going to tell us a story that related to molecules inside a small space. Okay, please join me to welcome Professor Robax. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Lin. Pleasure for me to take my first visit to this uh, amazing institution, which in less than 25 years has, uh, has uh, created a reputation for being one of the top uh, research uh, institutes worldwide. Uh, the molecules that I'm going to talk to you about today are called encapsulation complexes. And they are systems in which a molecule is more or less completely surrounded by either another molecule or an assembly of molecules. Now, they can be surrounded by covalent bonds, in which case these systems have lifetimes of years, or metal ligand interactions, which also have fairly robust lifetimes. The systems I'll tell you about today are held together by hydrogen bonds. So they are dynamic. They, have, they form and dissipate on a time scale of milliseconds to to minutes, but you'll see that's long enough for us to characterize these uh, in the solution state. Right. Uh, what the message will be today is about how 
molecules inside these small spaces behave very differently than molecules in bulk solution. In fact, they behave more like molecules inside enzyme active sites or on cell surface receptors. Uh, but I'll leave that for you to judge. But I promise to show you some structures that you cannot see any other way except uh, in the small synthetic spaces uh, I'll tell you about today. Right. Now, you could ask general questions such as, how do molecules get in and out of these spaces? Uh, is there room for two molecules in the space? Right. Uh, uh, what happens to, will they compress or contort? But the more specific and formal questions are listed here. I'll show you how uh, new stereochemistry uh, can be created inside. Uh, we'll talk about the dynamics of exchange, uh, data storage, uses, reaction chambers, and so on. Now, if you want to completely surround the molecule, then a spherical structure is not a bad place to start. And we started with something that is partly spherical. That is, you need at least some curvature to create a structure like this. And here is a panel, or a panel with a benzene ring that doesn't look very spherical, but because of the seven-membered rings on either side, there's curvature along the length of the structure, and the two five-membered rings create a fold in the structure. And as a result, you'll see that hydrogen bond donors, and that's what we'll use today, uh, and hydrogen bond acceptors are arranged in a self-complementary pattern so that when you bring two of these molecules together, concave face to concave face, uh, you'll create a seam of hydrogen bonds that's like a notional tennis ball. So the curvature you see of the seven-membered rings, here's the five-membered ring folds, and the curvature of the seven-membered rings now can create two halves that can be held together by fairly strong hydrogen bonding between the donors and acceptors. And this is where we begin. <clears throat> and it was quite easy to synthesize such a molecule from two commercially available materials the diphenyl glycoural, and we will use this module frequently throughout the hour, and tetrabromodurine. When these are heated in hot DMSO with potassium hydroxide, you get mostly an insoluble polymer. But fortunately, the material that dissolves in organic solvents is just this isomer with all of the aromatics on the same face, and it's obtained in about 20% yield. Uh, in fact, the preparation is so easy that there is a synthesis published in Journal of Chemical Education that is used occasionally in undergraduate institutions uh, in the United States. So I'm losing my audience already. <laughs> what did I say? Oh, the uh, IS uh, stopped. So oh. how we can set up. Oh, okay. Second <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't worry. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, it's okay when people go out one at a time, but when they leave in groups <laughs> while I'm talking, oh, it's painful. Painful. <laughs> right. Okay, so the molecule can be made easily. And it actually functions, all right? Here is the uh, NMR spectrum of methane straight from the fume hoods at MIT. And you see it's 
has quite a bit of ethane and even some propane in it. But if you bubbled this through a chloroform solution of this tennis ball-like molecule, then immediately you see two new signals. Uh, and I show you these because you recognize they're in a very unusual part of the spectrum. They're upfield from TMS. And they report on the location of the nuclei, the hydrogens. They are sandwiched between two aromatics. And the aromatics create a magnetic anisotropy that shields the nuclei from the applied uh, magnetic field. And so they appear shifted away upfield. So there's really never any question about where the molecules are. The other th important thing about this kind of spectrum is you'll notice that the signals are sharp and widely separated. And that speaks for a high energetic barrier between inside and outside. The exchange is slow on the NMR time scale. It's fast on the human time scale. The lifetime here of this capsule is on the order of one second or so. But it's slow on the NMR time scale so that you merely need to integrate these signals. And you can get equilibrium constants. You can then change the temperature and see how those respond. And from that data, you can get thermodynamic parameters. And we have done so for uh, many of the cases that I, I'll show you today. Right. Now, you may ask, why does the molecule go inside? Right. Uh, if you do some modeling, you should beware that what you see depends on the software that you use. Okay. So if you use a fairly crude uh, probe of, say, a solvent accessible surface for the two pieces of the softball and the methane inside, this golden drop, then you might <clears throat> reach the conclusion that methane is too large to fit inside this small space because those surfaces overlap. But here, using more sophisticated software from our uh, uh, graphics department, you see ethane, although this, this looks like, uh, according to my coworkers, this looks like a teddy bear in utero. Uh, you see that ethane even leaves some space around it. Right? And how much space you should fill in these encapsulation complexes is one of the messages of, of the lecture. It's possible to use the same sort of architecture with different spacer elements. That is the same glycouros, but now something smaller, tetramethylethylene. And now on the table, say, with the tennis ball, this would be about the size of a golf ball. And now we see some selectivity between ethane, which does not fit inside, and methane, which forms a very stable complex. So ethane would fill about 85% of the space. That is, the packing coefficient is very high. I mean, that number is high even for solids, let alone a gas. I mean, a typical solid is closely packed spheres, or about 74%. But 84 would be way too much space taken up inside the capsule. Whereas methane, you see, binds and fills about 50% of the space and makes for a stable uh, assembly. Right. Here is one, and I won't go into the details of the synthesis. This involves a much larger spacer, a triphenylene spacer and now has three glycouros on the same face. And I've modeled 
uh, one of the best guests for this, psych, or, uh, benzene inside. Uh, on the table, say, with the tennis ball, this would be about the size of, of a hamburger, and it would have about the same function. It binds disc-shaped molecules that fill the right amount of space. So you see a very nice complementarity or congruence of shapes and sizes uh, in this model. But the best guest for this system turns out to be cyclohexane. Uh, as you see from this modeling, the axial hydrogens above and below the cyclohexane plane are in gentle contact with the aromatic surfaces that define the ceiling and the floor of the capsule. So attractive CH pi interactions exist between the guest cyclohexane and the host structure, this capsule. And as a result, the ring flipping of cyclohexane is slowed down inside the capsule. This was our first observation of different behaviors inside and outside. But the ring flipping is slowed because in order to go from one chair to the twist boat, to the transition state, and to the other chair, you have to break these CH pi interactions and you raise the activation energy and slow down the process. Right. Here is a larger but still spherical structure that required a synthesis of 19 steps to make these 13 fused rings and the one bridge that causes the fold in the molecule, this fold. But again, the glycourals provide the hydrogen bond donors, the carbonyls here, the hydrogen bond acceptors. And we also added some additional hydroxyl groups along the structure for more hydrogen bonding. And now the system offers enough space to take in two molecules. Uh, two molecules of benzene when they're face to face, or a molecule such as ferrocene, shown here, that resemble two molecules of benzene face to face. Right? Now, in terms of volume, uh, this 10 to the minus 25 liters uh, it corresponds to about 300 cubic angstroms of space to fill inside this structure. On the table with a tennis ball, it would be about the size of a softball or, or a grapefruit. Right. Now, because the resting state of this capsule uh, contains in benzene, two molecules of benzene, uh, it shows some unusual binding properties for other molecules. For example, if you add a single larger molecule, like adamantane, you find that some adamantane goes in. But now, if you heat the system, more adamantane goes in. Right? And this is quite unexpected for association phenomena. Usually, heat will dissipate weak intermolecular complexes. But if you think about the cartoon of this equation, you will see why this happens. On the left-hand side of the equation, you see two particles. But on the right-hand side, you see three particles, because two benzenes are liberated. The association reaction is entropy-driven. And I dwell on this because this is generally the case in the capsules that we'll see when more than one molecule of solvent is resting inside. The, the driving force is largely entropic for encapsulation.
we spent a considerable amount of time to determine just how molecules get in and out of this capsule. This is done with simple substitution reactions and normal kinetic methods uh, using NMR. Uh, the adamantane-filled softball can be displaced by 2,2-paracyclophane, which is a much better guess, and this reaction is pretty much irreversible. Moreover, it is quite conveniently studied at NMR millimolar concentrations in solution. Typically, the half-life of this displacement is about 45 minutes. But is, it, is the substitution SN1-like or SN2-like? Well, the simplest idea of how the substitution could take place is by just taking the softball and pulling apart the two halves, exchanging one half for a new guest, and then putting the two back together again. But this would be energetically the most costly because you would have to destroy all of the hydrogen bonds and whatever forces there exist between the guest and the host. A less costly mechanism involves opening two flaps. That is, a mere inversion of a six-membered ring would open two flaps and create a sort of tunnel through which a displacement is easy to visualize. This leaves only four hydrogen bonds intact. And the cheapest way involves opening the adjacent flaps shown there on the right. This creates enough of an opening for the displacement, the exit and entrance, and still maintains six hydrogen bonds. And six hydrogen bonds in a typical organic solvent gives you a lifetime of at least a tenth of a second which is plenty long enough for many encounters to take place. Right. So we were able to work through all of the rates and equilibria in this displacement reaction. So you begin with the resident adamantane. You open one flap and then open the other flap. And now there's enough space for the displacement to occur with an incoming paracyclophane, and then things fold shut into the new assembly. And we were able to back out from the kinetic experiments all of the rates and equilibria involved in this reaction. Now, the reason I dwell on this is that it is quite general what happens in the exchange of guests in these capsules. The exchange of guests is much faster than the pulling apart or the dissipation of the whole capsule. Uh, moreover, in this case, the rate determining step depends on the concentration of the incoming guest. At high concentrations, every time the flaps open, the incoming displacement occurs. So the system is SN1-like. At low concentrations of the incoming paracyclophane, the flaps open many times before the displacement occurs, and the system behaves like an SN2 substitution. Again, this is pretty generalizable to all of the cases that I'll show you today. Now, it's possible to think of this sphere as a reaction chamber if you find a reaction that will fit inside. And because the resting state has two stacked benzenes inside, 
a reaction such as a Diels-Alder reaction that has a transition structure that is two stacked molecules should be an ideal candidate, and indeed it is. So the reaction of cyclohexadiene and parabenzoquinone at molar concentrations in an organic solvent has a half-life of about a day. But at the millimolar concentrations of an NMR experiment, the half-life is on the order of years. But now if I add the softball to this solution, then within a few hours I start to see the adduct inside. Okay? The acceleration is several thousand-fold, but it's acceleration. It's, it's not catalysis. It's because the adduct is the best guest of all of the possible combinations here, and it gradually fills the capsule. The reaction grinds to a halt in a classic form of product inhibition. But still, the uh, reaction is accelerated, and it's exquisitely selective. That is, larger quinones, such as naphthoquinone, are not accelerated because they do not fit inside the capsule. In subsequent cases, we have actually seen turnover uh, uh, in molecules with slightly different structures that do not fill the space as well. Uh, so there is the possibility, and not only in our capsules, but in others, for true catalysis uh, in these systems. But how do you think about this? Well, one way of thinking is purely about concentration. Uh, given the volume of about 350 cubic angstroms, it is possible to calculate the real concentration of a molecule inside the capsule. So a single molecule enjoys a concentration of around 4 molar. And two molecules at 4 molar each, you know, are expected to react just as fast inside this space. So there's no sort of acceleration due to hydrogen bonding or anything else. One way of just thinking about it is the pseudo-concentration of the reagents inside the small space. Another way of thinking about this has to do with the timing. That is, typically in solution, when two molecules come together to form a diffusion complex, the lifetime of that complex is about one nanosecond before the solvent cage breaks down and the molecules drift apart. When the two molecules encounter each other inside this capsule, for a second or so, there's plenty of time for them to find the transition state for the reaction to take place. So, so space and time inside are causing this acceleration. Here is a, another kind of capsule that is made from this curved structure, bowl-like structure, called a resource cinerine, about which more later, uh, the walls are built up, and now the self-complementarity is with these imides, hydrogen bond donors and acceptors, that create now eight bifurcated hydrogen bonds when two of these come together. On, on the table with the tennis ball, this molecule would be about the size of a can of tennis balls. It's a cylindrical structure, and it's the shape of the space inside that causes its really bizarre behavior of structures that are confined. And I will show you uh, this as a cartoon occasionally. Now, what is the shape of the space inside? It's shown here rotating on the right. 
Notice it's tapered from the resource cinerines at the ends. And then the middle part is two square prisms that are rotated 45 degrees with respect to one another. And that's uh, also emphasized here in a cross section of the capsule. The same space uh, is outlined in blue. And here are cross sections between two of the benzene rings of that shallow bowl resource scenery that caused the tapering. And we'll see what fits into that space. So molecules that are sort of congruent in size and shape are excellent guests for this capsule. Uh, here is dicyclohexyl carbodiamide. You will know this is a great dehydrating agent. But inside the capsule, its reactivity is turned off because there are mechanical barriers between it inside and, say, acids outside. Likewise, uh, terphenyl or transtilbene, but not cystilbene, fit very well inside. But one of the properties that gives this capsule an unusual selectivity has to do with its ability to pick two separate molecules that together fill the right amount of space. So in benzene, two molecules of benzene go inside, or two molecules of paraxylene. But if you mix the two solvents, then the only capsule you see has one molecule of benzene and one molecule of paraxylene inside because that combination fills just a little more half the space in solution. And that's an ideal combination. And now you can use this to coax in two separate molecules, uh, what we call a single solvent, single solute uh, interactions in that space. So let me show you how this works. If I take a molecule, a mixture of chloroform and paraethyl toluene, again, I see two sets of sharp signals upfield, and they represent two isomeric arrangements. We call them social isomers of the two possibilities one in which the methyl group is close to the chloroform, and one in which the ethyl group. Again, because the signals are widely separated, it indicates that they cannot exchange positions while they're inside. They have to go out and reassemble in the new arrangement. So what this allows you to do is to make certain contacts between the two guests inside and to see how energetically those contacts are contributing to their interactions. The reason that they cannot exchange is that chloroform is too big to slip past this structure while it's inside the capsule. And the paradise-substituted aromatic is too large to tumble freely, which would also interconvert these two. And that gives rise to some unusual behaviors. So let me show you how this works. Uh, with benzene and paraethyl toluene, we see the two different isomers. And the isomer with the ethyl group in contact with the benzene is favored. And from this equilibrium constant, you can calculate that it's favored by about one kilocalorie per mole. But if I just change one of the atoms in the paraethyl toluene to nitrogen, I find that these preferences are reversed. And now the N-methyl group prefers to be in contact down here with the resource cinerine, 
rather than the methyl group. And so using a panel of 15 solvents and solutes, we were able to go through functional group interactions inside this small space and determine them at the sub-kilocalorie level. And you cannot do this in solution because you cannot line these molecules up in the two ways that I've shown you here and maintain them in that position, or in the gas phase, or even in the solid phase. Now, it's possible to really pack things in. And I show you, again, 2,2-paracyclophane packed inside a half of the capsule. And you see it's a very nice square object in a square space. But 2,2-paracyclophane wants to rotate. It wants to tumble. It wants to move around. But in order for it to do so, something has to give. And because the paracyclophane is rigid, it's the capsule that gives. It undergoes breathing motions that distort the hydrogen bonds, but this is a relatively inexpensive, uh, energetically speaking, inexpensive result, but it allows the paracyclophane to rotate inside. It's easy to measure this rotation because every quarter or 90 degrees exchanges the environment of this panel and this panel. So in the NMR spectrum, you see the two singlets. As you heat, they coalesce. And at the coalescence temperature, you can calculate the activation barrier and the rate of rotation. Right. Now, why do I dwell on this? It's because the rate of rotation depends on what else is in there with the paracyclophane. With a large molecule, such as carbon tetrachloride here, the carbon tetrachloride forces the paracyclophane into the tapered ends where there's more, if you like, friction to the rotation. And the rotation is slow. With a smaller molecule, such as ethylene, the paracyclophane floats higher toward the center of the assembly, where the breathing motions allow a more rapid rotation. So the rotation of paracyclophane is an indirect measure of the size of the other molecule. It's also an independent measure. It's quite different than the A values of cyclohexane axial and equatorial substituents or in biaeral rotors. This is a different measure of how much space a molecule takes up. I just co-encapsulate it and study the rate of rotation of paracyclophane. So you see, with smaller molecules, such as like toluene, it's short enough to tumble freely inside, and you don't see that social isomerism. But with paradise substituted molecules, separate signals are seen for these two methyl groups because it's too long to tumble inside, and it gives rise to the social and other isomerisms. Right. Now, it's possible to think about these as nanoscale data storage vehicles, and I'll show you how. So in chloroform solution, if you take the capsule and evaporate it and heat it and pump on it overnight under a vacuum, and then the next morning you add some methanol, you find exactly three molecules of chloroform are liberated for each capsule. And the NMR spectrum shows that separate signals exist for this chloroform, the ones on the ends, and the one in the middle. And the same thing is true for isopropyl chloride. That's again because these molecules are too thick to slip past each other while they're inside that capsule. 
uh, even 1,2-dichloroethane, which is longer and narrower, shows separate signals for the ones on the end and the one in the middle, but these signals are slightly broadened. And you can see exchange occurs between them fairly slowly, but occasionally the shape of these molecules allows them to snake past each other and exchange positions inside the capsule. But if we take a capsule filled with chloroform, and now we add a drop of isopropyl chloride, then in the NMR, you see two new arrangements. And we call these constellations. They're also diastereomers, but unlike diastereomers in typical organic compounds, where their relationship is defined by covalent connectedness. Here, the relationship is enforced by these mechanical barriers of the capsule. Okay. And we call these constellations. And if you now add another drop or so of isopropyl chloride, you see two new arrangements one with chloroform in the middle and one with chloroform at the ends. And then finally, with excess isopropyl chloride, you can flush out all the chloroform. Uh, in fact, if you have access to a 900 megahertz spectrometer and you use equal volumes of chloroform and isopropyl chloride, you can see all six of these arrangements because they're pretty much the same energy. Right. But these arrangements represent information. That is, there are six bits of information that you can arrange in this two or so nanometer space so that if you could write these at will and maintain them for indefinite periods of time and then read them out rapidly, you would really have nanoscale data storage. With three different molecules, there are 18 possibilities, 18 bits of information, and here is one of them. This is an anion inside. It's hexafluorophosphate, sandwiched between isopropyl chloride and one chloroform. And this forms spontaneously when you have all three of these species in solution. It is by far the most stable arrangement because it puts the anionic phosphate here near the seam of hydrogen bonds. But in theory, 18 bits of information in, in two angst or two uh, nanometer space. OK, let me t take a closer look at the space inside this capsule. You know, I think it was a famous Chinese architect who said, you know, it doesn't matter really what the building looks like on the outside. It's the space that it encloses that defines the function of the structure. Right? And so look carefully here at this tapered space. Each of these squares is one angstrom. And again, depending on the software you use as a probe, you find that, and where you call the end of the structure, you find that that space is less than 17 angstroms in length and about seven angstroms in width. Right. And now if you uh, combine a solution of tetradecane, and normal C14 and the capsule, you find a beautiful first order NMR spectrum for this compound, which is unusual enough. But you see the methyl group here is shifted about five parts per million from where it is out in solution, and so on. Very nice shifts. And these correspond to computed nucleus-independent chemical shifts that you can calculate from the aromatic anisotropy of these panels. 
you see the maximum shift is right about here at the top of the resource center range. And now if you move toward the nuclei, move toward the center of the structure, they move downfield. But no matter what software you use, you conclude that tetradecane is too long to fit inside this capsule if it's in an extended relaxed conformation. Uh, that length from carbon to carbon is about 20 angstroms, and then you need some more space for the hydrogens. So the only way the tetradecane could fit inside the capsule is to coil into a helical structure. And so compression into that structure makes it shorter, short enough to fit inside. And it also makes it thicker. And that thickness now allows attractive CH pi interactions between the aromatic panels of the host and the CH bonds on the surface of the guest. Now, each one of the turns involved is a gauche or skew-butane interaction. And in the liquid phase, this costs you a little more than half a kilocalorie per mole. Right? So you have to pay to squeeze this molecule and compress it. And the consequence is that a hydrogen on C1 will be close to hydrogens on C5 because of that gauche interaction. Hydrogen on C2 will be close to C6, and so on up the chain. And indeed, this is what you see in the two-dimensional NMR spectra. You see cross peaks between carbon 1 and 5, 2 and 6, 3 and 7, and so on. And so, not only is this an unusual spectrum for tetradecane, this is tetradecane coiled in a helical conformation. And this is something you could never arrange out in bulk solution or in the gas phase or in the solid state. But inside this well-defined space, it's there and it's stable. Now, if I add just one more carbon, so C15, I see nothing inside. In fact, the capsule doesn't form. It's in some other aggregate. Okay? But the methyl group of C15, the methyls on either end, are sort of blunt instruments. So what if I sharpen them? What if I make them a little narrower? Will they now fit inside the tapered space on either end? So we obtain the primary acetylene. You see, this is one of the narrowest, or if you like, sharpest functional groups. And now it fits inside. You see, again, a beautiful, beautiful first order spectrum. And here is the acetylenic hydrogen inside. All right? So the shape of the space determines really what goes on. Now, Dariush Ajami was able to alter the shape of the space of this particular capsule by adding glycourals. They're rich in hydrogen bonds, and they have some curvature. And they will insert, in fact, four of them insert between the two halves of the glycourol. And moreover, and unexpectedly, they insert in such a manner that they're twisted off the axis of the capsule to give a chiral arrangement. So this and its mirror image are formed. As a result, the length is increased by about seven angstroms, and the volume is increased by about 200 cubic angstroms. And now, if I put tetradecane inside, it can fit quite nicely in a fully relaxed extended conformation. So here's the cartoon. Here is the model of the system. 
But how do I know that tetradecane is relaxed? Well, I can compare the two, the tetradecane in the two capsules. Here it is in the compressed, tightly coiled conformation, and here in the relaxed conformation. You see the signal for C2 and C3 and so on have moved downfield. Moreover, the hydrogens on some of the carbons appear as diastereotopic because they're in a chiral macro environment. So here are two states of tetradecane, tightly compressed, but it wants to relax. It's pushing on the two ends of the capsule. And here, uh, in a fully relaxed, extended conformation. And what Dario Shajami uh, engineered was a system where he could control the two different states by acid-base chemistry. He prepared a glycouro that had a remote basic site on it. This is the sort of business part that allows the insertion, but this basic nitrogen allows protonation. And so uh, with this glycouro, uh, the extended capsule was formed with C14 inside. But if you take that NMR sample and bubble in dry HCl, the glycoural nitrogen is protonated, it precipitates, and it leaves the C14 inside the capsule in a tightly coiled conformation. But this is reversible, because now in the same NMR tube, if you bubble in trimethylamine, it deprotonates the glycoural, it goes into solution, inserts into the capsule, and gives the extended relaxed conformation. And you can go through this cycle of acid and base in the same NMR tube through six cycles before the salts build up so much that you can't get a spectrum. But along the way, what you have is a system, a spring-loaded system, under the control of acids and bases, the compression and the relaxation. Right. Now, there's another way that pressure exerts itself in these systems. And I realize that it's impolite to talk about phase or pressure when you're down to two or three molecules. But gases really do behave differently inside these systems than liquids or solids. They take up more space. For example, if I take the capsule and I bubble cyclopropane through a solution, I see three cyclopropanes inside. And since I know what the volume is, I can use the ideal gas law to calculate the pressure. And it turns out that pressure is almost 300 atmospheres. And that's a ridiculous figure, because I know that I'm bubbling in it at ambient pressure. Right? So you say, OK, you shouldn't use that gas law. You should use the van der Waals approximation. But that makes things even worse, because that requires that you take into account how much space the gas takes up. As you see, it's substantial. So you get an even higher pressure. Right? So what's going on here? Right? It doesn't matter if you use the extended capsule. If you have some of the glycoural, now you get four cyclopropanes inside. Uh, you see a little cross peak in each one of them. So every once in a while, they slip past one another, but still you see ridiculously high pressures that you calculate. Okay? So the answer is these systems are far from ideal, as in the ideal gas law. For example, the gases are not point masses, nor are the collisions with the walls elastic. In fact, they're probably pretty sticky because there are attractive forces between 
the aromatic panels, and the CH bond. Okay? So those attractive forces lower the energy of the system and allow you to create such high pressures inside. And I dwell on this because exactly the same thing happens in metallo-organic frameworks. You have large aromatic panels that are sticky to the surface of the gases that they absorb, and they have lower energies that allow you to calculate ridiculous pressures. And if anyone is ever able to you know, develop single-walled carbon nanotubes, I predict that hydrocarbons will be great guests for these. You know, simple uh, methane, cyclopropane, anything, because you'll see wonderful attractive forces between the guest and the host. One of the things that happens with this glycouro system is that if you have an even longer guest, you can keep inserting glycourals. Uh, for example, this is anandamide. It's a natural product that is the ethanol amide of arachidonic acid. And this is, uh, anandamide is the natural painkiller that your body makes that binds to the cannabinoid receptors in your brain. Okay, it's a natural product. It's uh, 20 some carbons long plus the uh, ethanol emit, and it forms a beautiful complex here with two belts of glycourals inside. But let me show you a few more systems before I quit uh, that are a little more complex in a different way. Uh, that's useful. All right. Let me see. Somehow, somehow I can't get rid of this. Well, I will just have to soldier on. Yeah, but it's still up there. Yeah. It's not here, right? Well, I, I just uh, encourage you to shut one eye <laughs> and ignore that. Right. Right. Uh, if I take now the tennis ball and I cut each piece in half. What it means is that I've desymmetrized the molecule. And by desymmetrize, I put underneath this, I put a superior hydrogen bond donor, okay, uh, and a, uh, in the form of a sulfamid. And the complementary superior hydrogen bond acceptor is this glycoural. And to get the best hydrogen bonds, now molecules have to come together head to tail in what is a tetrameric capsule. That is, the sulfamid and the glycoural form a seam of hydrogen bonds and four molecules can come together. Still there, Jesus. Okay, so we did make the structure, but in molecules, in solvents such as chloroform, the molecules either wouldn't dissolve or they wouldn't form capsules. But when you add the right guest, and one of the guests is adamantane dione, shown in the bottom, then as soon as you can get to the spectrometer, the capsule forms. Five molecules come together because now the adamantane dione 
fills the right amount of space inside the capsule and then interacts with the seam of hydrogen bonds above and below. So five molecules, no problem. In addition, in this case, we were able to take a structure without solubilizing groups and solve the crystal structure. And it showed exactly what the NMR uh, solution studies predicted. The carbonyl is directed toward the seam of hydrogen bonds. Uh, and uh, four molecules create the capsule and one guest inside. Now, I'd like to show you <laughs> even further desymmetrization of the structure. Uh, the, the left side of the module is different from the right side, the sulfamide. The front has the aromatic groups on it, and the back does not. And now, if I distinguish between the top and the bottom of the molecule, I will have distinguished in the three Cartesian coordinates. That is left and right, up and down, front and back. And as a result, the object has to be chiral. And so we made that panel, and we resolved it on a Perkle uh, chromatography column. And when it assembles, it assembles to give a chiral and enantiopure space. That is the structure shown here with three uh, twofold rotational axes. The best guess for this uh, shows a fairly modest enantioselectivity of about 70% EE. And that case is 3-methylcyclohexanone. The ketone, right about there, interacts with this uh, enantiomer with the seam of hydrogen bonds above, and it positions the methyl group toward one of the larger spaces inside uh, the capsule. Ah, this isn't so bad. Right. OK, uh, what about a volleyball? Right. Uh, a volleyball is really uh, nothing more than an inflated cube. You see it has six panels and eight corners. And there's a little difference between, say, a, a Japanese volleyball and an American version. But still, notionally, they're the same. Six panels, eight corners. Right? The shape of the panels are a little different. Well, uh, the glycoural that I mentioned to you before uh, has just what you need for this. Some of these glycourals are commercially available, uh, or you can make them in 100 gram quantities in a sing single afternoon by condensing almost any aromatic halide with resorcinol. Right? Uh, we use large alkyl groups here to maintain solubility in organic solvents. But the curvature is relatively shallow. And because these have been around for more than 30 years, there are a lot of x-ray structures, dozens of x-ray structures of this. But only one of them ever showed a hexameric assembly in the solid state. And this was due to Atwood and McGillivray. Uh, in 1997, they crystallized this from hot nitrobenzene. They were unable to determine what's inside because it was disordered. But at least in the solid state, the system assembles. But even before, in Japan, uh, Aoyama had characterized the shallow, bowl-like structures with single small molecule gas as one-to-one -one complexes. We now know that these are six-to-six -six complexes. 
in fact, a capsule forms in solution. And you can make that capsule form by simply adding one very good guest, such as a large group as like tetrahexyl ammonium ion inside. It spontaneously assembles, and it assembles with six panels, and we'll see eight water molecules. In fact, you don't even need a guest. All you need is a wet solvent. And this was shown by Yoram Cohen. If you take the resource cinerine and in dissolve it in scrupulously dried benzene, it doesn't go into solution. But if you add a drop of water, everything goes into solution, and you see a beautiful assembly of 22 molecules, eight molecules of benzene inside, and now you see one molecule of water at each of the corners, and six resource cinerines to make that inflated cube. So again, 22 molecules versus entropy. They form spontaneously. OK, finally, let me tell you of our experiences with, with self-sorting. Uh, self-sorting is, is one of the characteristics of these systems, which are self-assembled, that is, spontaneously assembled. Uh, and during the assembly process, corrections have to be made that tell, say, self from non-self in order to get the completed cooperative structures. So we looked at self-sorting in our hydrogen bonded systems. Here is the resource cinerine, uh, the hexamer with the eight waters in it. And here is the seemingly unrelated Cylindrical capsule, here eight chloroform guests, here three chloroform guests. And now when you mix these together, you expect self-sorting, but in fact, you see a single capsule that has a resource centering cap, and then two, two chloroforms inside. So they form a hybrid. They do not self-sort. Now, you can actually watch this process in, in real time using fluorescence resonance energy transfer because that works at the nanomolar concentrations where the assembly is slow enough to follow. So we prepared a resource cinerine that had a fluorescent dye, a perylene, it's an acceptor dye. And we prepared also a cylindrical capsule that had a pyrene covalently attached, a donor dye. And when you mix these together, you will see a fret occurs only when the uh, acceptor and donor dye are on the same molecule. It's a technique well studied uh, by biochemists. So when we did this in the presence of a good guest, what we see is over the course of seven days, we see the fret signal build in, and using a single guest like 2,2-paracyclophane, we can drive things entirely to this. So we can watch the assembly take place in real time uh, using FRET at nanomolar concentrations. Well, you can say that maybe those two were related, but here is the original tennis ball, and here is the cylindrical capsule, and these do not look at all related, at least to me, but yet when you mix them together, they irreversibly form this hybrid capsule with one half of the tennis ball and one half of the cylindrical capsule. So in most of the systems that we've studied, self-sorting does not occur. These things are really quite promiscuous. They form hybrids quite easily. 
And because of the hydrogen bonding information, the curvature, and the final instruction filling the space, they spontaneously self-assemble. OK, this is what I hope to tell you about, and uh, not so much about my backup state of my computer. Uh, you've seen the names of the uh, authors on the individual slides, but I need to bring your attention to Lubo Sebo. He was a postdoctoral in my group who prepared all of these videos, and he did so in his spare time uh, on a laptop using free downloadable software like 14 years ago. Okay? And they're still, still really useful to display molecules of this sort. If you want to know how to do this, visit my website. There will be uh, several more examples of these uh, videos, uh, and they won't have this annoying message <laughs> on, on the slide. Uh, finally, uh, let me uh, acknowledge the support of the Skaggs Institute, a philanthropic family that each year at Scripps supports something like 30 professors, 60 graduate students, and 200 postdoctorals. Uh, uh, in the last uh, year or so, I have opened a lab at Fudan University supported by the Thousand Talents program, and I'm grateful uh, for the financial support they provide, and also the National Science Foundation. Right. Uh, and finally, uh, this is the campus of the Scripps Research Institute. Uh, it's along Torrey Pines Road here, and my laboratories are right here, overlooking the 10th tee of the Torrey Pines Golf Club, and then out over uh, the uh, uh, Pacific Ocean. I, I realize it's nothing as spectacular as the view you have here, but it's good enough for me. So if you're ever in La Jolla, uh, come, come visit, and I'll be happy to uh, repay the hospitality that you've kindly shown me here today. Thank you. Okay, wow. thank you, Professor Rebeck. Uh, I think everyone enjoyed the talk, had uh, interesting, educational, and uh, I'm sure very comprehensive as well. Okay, so now next uh, question. Question from audience. Okay. <laughs> uh, one of the capsules, you have 20 fancy molecules in it. Uh, eight. Oh, eight. Eight benzenes, eight waters, six sides, 22 altogether. Is the benzene molecule randomly oriented? Yes. They tumble freely. They show a single NMR spectrum line, a little bit broadened, but yes. So if you can put in eight, so there's going to be seven, six, five, and all those. Yeah. yeah. Well, no. It, it spontaneously works out to eight. Okay, it doesn't form if there's seven. Okay, uh, let me. So the question is, you know, what is the state of a molecule with eight benzenes inside, or how do I know? Right. Okay, uh, this is the NMR spectrum. And you have to take my word for it, uh, of the resting state in wet benzene. Now, if I add a little bit of chloroform, I see the original uh, assembly, and now an assembly that is, I think, seven molecules of benzene and one molecule of chloroform. And then if I add more chloroform, I can get the whole distribution. Okay? But I think each one of the capsules inside has eight guest molecules. Okay. Yeah. So, sorry. 
Good. Uh, in your talk, you talk about geometric confinement almost totally. Yeah. You don't mention electromagnetic confinement at all. Right. And perhaps you can explain why you don't. But in regard to your pressure dilemma, it may be quite simply that the the, the, the molecules, the gas inside the, the cylinder, uh, the thermal KT energy vanishes, doesn't it, at this scale? And that would lead you to funny results on the pressure. So, in summary, my, my questions are, why, how can you explain all of this basically with with geometric confinement. This is effectively classical physics. And somehow it, it seems to work. And can you well, help me out? Yeah, okay. The question I think is that how can I describe all this with just geometric constraints rather than electromagnetic yeah. ones? Well, you know, as organic chemists tend to look at these things as as objects, you know, the atoms as uh, uh, balls and sticks that provide barriers. That is, we, we do know that there are no th such things as steric effects. They are really electron-electron repulsions, okay? So it may be that I use the language of organic chemistry when a physicist would use different vocabulary to describe the same thing. But there are mechanical barriers between inside and outside that prevent free flow. Okay? If you see this type of pollution or electromagnetic to a uh -huh. You can see the same type of effect. There's a different chemistry going on inside, and you, 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 at least I have come to the conclusion that you effectively ionize them, those, those molecules, and they will fit, they will adjust to, to that confinement. Uh, well, uh, but in your work, you don't see that, I guess. Well, I, you know, I, I see what the NMR tells me, and in those cases that I mentioned, what the crystallography tells me, okay? I see molecules confined in a space, right? Uh, what the ultimate cause of the confinement or what some of the causes of the confinement are uh, may be electromagnetic. That's, that would be fine with me. But in communicating with the organic community, I need to use this vocabulary. If, if, if the outer molecule is closed, can the guest ever get inside, or does it have to open? Right. There are cases. You know, these are dynamic systems. There are ca capsules held together by covalent bonds, okay? And things do not get inside or leave once they're inside, right? These were the original carceran molecules. There are cases with the fullerenes, you know, C60, that have helium trapped inside and never comes out as long as the covalent bonds are intact. Right. So I, I think it would take you know some quantum tunneling, uh, and which is you know not on the right scale for molecules of this site to get through the walls. Uh, otherwise, all right. Okay. Well, thank you very much for you know wonderful lecture and now it's a lot of interesting uh, ideas and of interesting ideas. I think for the, the, the our king is given the challenge, probably it's a part of us in principle to selectively uh, bond 
suitable lens this out humanity things I capture and, and, and then use the other one longer shorter one yeah in, in a solution so then ideally it can use to separate us out can molecules yeah parents yeah. yeah I think the the question is can we use the capsules to separate molecules of different length yeah uh, yes, yes, we can. Uh, uh, we have done pairwise competition experiments between alkanes of different lengths, uh, and it turns out that that uh, C11 has about the right length to fill the space properly. And then we did. Uh, a, a competition experiment where we had five different alkanes uh, and uh, I think C9 goes in first very rapidly on mixing and then it comes out replaced slowly by C10 and then finally C11 builds up. Uh, so we can do uh, equilibrium selection and also kinetic selections with these. Uh, I should also say that, you know, worldwide there are about 20 research groups working on encapsulation phenomena. Uh, most of them work with uh, metal ligand systems uh, and they have done beautiful selectivity, catalysis, reactivity, uh, amplifications, uh, particularly the groups uh, in Tokyo, uh, Shionoya and Fujita, and uh, Ken Raymond and Bob Bergman at, at Berkeley. So, you know, I, if I just had one slide on each of those results, I, I wouldn't have time to talk to you today. But there are there are remarkable things going on elsewhere. Of uh, potential application, I think uh, the table shows in progress good for say for drug delivery or so on. So any work that I have done in to, to demonstrate those yeah. possibility, to use the capsules uh, or uh, for, for well, I think I th the question has to do with with some practical application. Uh, I you know if. <clears throat> Uh, people suggest drug delivery, right? But if I calculate uh, how much a single molecule of penicillin costs and one of my capsules, <laughs> then I would have to turn it over maybe an Avogadro number of times <laughs> to make it commercially reasonable. Uh, uh, there are uh, uh, reports of transport across membranes with molecules, container molecules, and uh, uh, that at least is, you know, recycled. But I think the, the best application that I've seen came out about two years ago by Fujita, who crystallized his capsules and then in the very small crystals, he could soak it in solutions of small molecules that are not solids, and then take the structure again and get the crystal structure of a liquid, <laughs> okay? So he can s determine structures that, that would ver be very difficult to determine otherwise. And I think that this is a, a beautiful and practical example. Right. Thank you very much. Right. Yes. Okay, so um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, in case of uh, texture taking uh, uh, encapsulated, yes. we can see that the chemical shape in the NMR spectrum is very well separated, yeah. uh, meaning that uh, the hydrogens have very different magnetic environment. Right. I'm wondering whether you have Check out the uh, 
Oh. Uh, so the question is, uh, yeah, do we see any changes in the IR of these encapsulated oh, yeah. molecules? Yeah. Yes. Now, yeah, we we have not, but other people have. In some in some covalent capsules uh, that are pretty permanent, uh, you can see in some cases amides inside the carbonyl stretch makes it look more like a gas phase, and in other cases, with the same amide inside but in a smaller capsule, it makes the amide stretch look more like a solid, <laughs> okay? So it, it, the applications have been done, uh, but as far as I know, there's no sort of general feeling about you know, what does the molecule inside actually experience uh, in terms of gas phase or solid phase? Right. Yeah. Another question is, uh, whether how difficult it is to char uh, characterize your uh, post gas contracts right. uh, using quicksilver? Well, uh, it, the the characterization uh, in all cases that I've shown you is in solution by NMR. Uh, we uh, have also many cases in the gas phase. That's when we have charged molecules inside, then we can use soft ionization techniques like ESI because they act as labels for for the assemblies in the gas phase. And so when Christoph Schally was in the group, well, you know, we characterized everything in the gas phase too. And whenever crystallographers appear in the group, they make derivatives to characterize in the solid state. So, so I'm pretty confident in, in the structures. Uh, yeah. What I'm thinking is the thing is, uh, in the crystals, uh, in, in, in the crystal lectures, uh, we may be able to detect some changes in the bonding. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, particularly, yeah. No, it is possible, and, and people have seen changes like. Uh, in some of the some of the metal ligand capsules, there are base pairs, and you can see that they're more tightly held than they are out in solution. Right? That is shorter hydrogen bonds. So certain interactions are amplified in the small space because they're not competing with the solvent, for example. Right? Yeah. So it's, it does seem that there are, you know, different rules for molecules in small spaces than in bulk solution. Yeah. Yeah, another. How do you get a molecule like this in the gas? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how... This one has been characterized by, yeah, yeah, this assembly, and even more, even more complex ones. Uh, but you wait for it in the vacuum? They, they use what's called electrospray, where you have tiny droplets, and you expose them to a, a, a sudden drop in pressure, and the, the solvent molecules start evaporating, and pretty soon, the only thing that's left is the the assembly. But the hydrogen bond would be moving around, and it kind of like breaks apart very quickly. Uh, in the gas phase, the hydrogen bonds are really strong, okay, because they're not uh, interacting with solvents, for example. So it's really hard to pull things apart in the gas phase. Yeah. 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 So there's a whole science of uh, 
uh, Christoph Schale at Berlin, who studies these things in the gas phase. Right. Right. Do you, do you see, a, do you see anom anomalous charges? I cannot explain this molecular dynamics. Do you see experimentally any anomalous charge being produced? I don't, but I, I confess I haven't looked for it either. Right. Yeah. Because you did just mention you were seeing differences in the IR spectrum. Yeah. So probably there's some electromagnetic effect. Sure. Yeah. I grant you that. Yeah. Right. Any other questions from people in the back? Or maybe I have a simple question. All right. Any measurement of a, a complex uh, constant? Because we are uh, in organic chemistry, normally we teach uh, in organic chemistry, we say the equilibrium constant to describe the stability of a complex. Yes. So any measurement of that, or what's yes. the magnitude of the those com yeah, constants? Uh, for, for the <coughs> molecules, the cylindrical molecule, uh, we, can, we can measure equilibria from the FRET experiments. And they're in the nanomolar range. So 10 to the uh, ninth per mole. Right? Uh, for the, the, the tennis ball, we have measured something in, and it depends on the solvent because of the competition. Yes. Uh, in chloroform, uh, the association constants are about 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 6th, right? So it's quite a lot. Yeah. It, it is, but we have never seen an empty capsule. So what you measure very easily are, are relative affinities from competition experiments and apparent association complexes uh, from FRET experiments. Okay, so I think uh, if not, I think uh, that's uh, thank you for Professor Robert again for the talk. Right, thank you. Thank you.